And, and, and this, is, this is what we'll be looking at for the next uh, 10 or 12 weeks or so. I know some of you are going, yeah, get a T-shirt. We, need to get, man, we might be able to get a T-shirt with something like that. Would you guys like to try to see if we could see? That looks good, man, the good life. But, but you see, it's a walk through the book of Philippians. And, um, and I know that we, we haven't done this before. We haven't done things like go through a book, like the book of Philippians or any book. We've never been like through the whole book. Now, we've been in some series before where I've taken passages of Scripture like Built for Battle. A lot of you have the T-shirts from Built for Battle. Built for Battle came from the book of 1 Samuel, and it was like about uh, 10 chapters or 12 chapters in there, and, that, and five or six messages came out of those 10 chapters uh, about King David's life and what God does today as we're built for battle, just like that. Um, and so we've done some things like that, but we've never just kind of taken a book and started at the first and just went through the whole whole book and s- to see what God would say to us through this whole book. And I used to do this quite a bit when I was younger, but for some reason, I just kind of fell away from that. But in these, these days that we're in right now, I don't know, I just feel kind of a, I feel a, a pull for this. I, I feel the Lord, you know, um, kind of drawing me in my thoughts and my mind, you know, and you say, how does the Lord speak to you? Well, he speaks to me just like he speaks to you. I mean, I don't hear a voice thundering out of the sky or anything like that, you know. I don't see something written with fingers on a wall, you know. <laughs> I don't see any. I just, like you, I mean, I sense it inside. I, I feel it in my, in, my, in my heart when I pray about things. Uh, this, it pops into my mind. It's something I, 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 I just can't. I circle around and dwell on it, and it just won't go away. And, you know, I mean, same way you do. Same way you know when the Lord's speaking to you about things. He just burdens you about it, and he impresses you with it. And when you think about it, it you go, yeah, you know, I, man. I need to do that. Well, this is the way it's been with the book of Philippians because these days that we're living in are tough, tough days. At the, when school starts back, I'm going to start on the book of Revelation, and I'm going to go verse by verse through Revelation, and I don't know how long it may take us. Now, if you guys quit coming, I'm going to quit preaching on it, and I'm going to start preaching on something else. <laughs> but, but I don't know how you're going to last through the book of Revelation, but uh, I'm going to try to be faithful to it and give you God's word of it and tell you what that means for right now and what that means for us and what we need to do about this and how we need to look at things and the things we're seeing every day that show us that his coming is soon and, and be ready and all of that. And uh, we're going to do that starting when school starts back in because you guys are too flaky in the summertime. You go, you go everywhere. And although you're not going to need to, you know, just you're not going to need every single, if you miss a week, you, it's not going to kill you and you're not going to know what's going on. It's not like that because I'm not going to do it like that. But, but you do need to be there. You do need to, you need, you need to be here. And you need to, 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 to week after week uh, hear what God has to say about these things as we go through his word because it's very, it's very important, and especially in these days. Because I know you guys sense this, right? I mean, I'm not, I'm not telling you anything that you're not already sensing, I don't think, about, hey, something is up is all I know. Something is going on here. This is not usual. Uh, everything that's good seems to be bad. Everything that's bad seems to be good. Everything that's up used to be down. Everything that's down used to be up. It's like we're living in the twilight zone, living in delusionville. And what is this? Well, Revelation has a lot to say about it, and uh, we'll hear it, and we'll know it. Now, to kind of get us ready for that, um, here we are at Philippians. And even though Philippians really has nothing to do with the book of Revelation, so it's not like, a, it's not like okay, we've got to look at Philippians before we can look at Revelation. I just wanted to uh, share with you some, some uh, verse-by-verse stuff and let you just kind of get a little bit of a feel of what it feels like to move through a book and uh, stuff like that. And so uh, the Lord spoke to my heart about Philippians. You know why? Because... You could, if you had your Bible, if you had a Bible, I know most of us, we don't carry Bibles anymore. Some do. See, Mike sitting on the front row with his Bible open. Some of you got, yeah, yeah, there's his brother. He's got his Bible back there. There's one in the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These, uh, these are books, guys. These, you know, these are 
like they have paper in them and they have writing on the paper and you can read it and then to turn it over and then it's got some writing on the back and you read that and you just go right through it. They used to be around prevalent, but now people carry their Bible in their phone or their pad or whatever it might be. And, you know, we don't, but if you did have a Bible and it was a book, you could write at the top of the Philippians, the letter. It's not Philippians either, by the way. I know, you know, uh, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to make light of you or make fun of you, but I know a lot of you guys weren't reared in the church. You, you weren't brought up in church. And so, you know, when you see the name of something like, you know, like you see right there, you might, you just might read that and say, the book of the Philippians? What is the Philippians? Uh, you know, and, and, and they're a group of people, and they're not Filipinos. Uh, they're just, they're, they're Bible people, okay? So this was a city, this was a city that, that the Apostle Paul went to called Philippi, and when he wrote a book or wrote a letter to them, it was called a letter to the Philippians, and so that's what this book is about. But you could write up above it, if, if you had a Bible and you wanted to write in it, you could write up above it the joy book, because that's what Philippians is about, the joy book. How many of you feel like, man, life's flat, it's dull, it's hard, uh, there's not a lot of excitement going on, and I just feel, you know, I'm just feeling down. I'm just, that's just all I can say, I'm just down. Well, if you're feeling that way, let me just say that what you might simply need is just a good dose of the book of Philippians, because the book of Philippians is a book about joy. It's a book, book about 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 deliverance and, and, and excitement and enthusiasm in the Lord. Uh, and, and so it's the joy book, uh, 17 times. It's only four little short chapters, and, four, and 17 times in this book, the Lord, uh, the Apostle Paul talks about uh, joy and, and enthusiasm and excitement and happiness and so forth. So I think it's a good book for us today, and it really works with a lot of problems we have. Would you like to hear some of the problems? I wrote them down. See, when I was studying, I said, let me, let me just see what, whether this would be good. All right, now, I'm just, I just wrote them out, and I'm going I'm to tell you what it, most of what we're going to look at in this book. All right, here, here it is. All right, how to enjoy people. That's today. Any of you ever have any problem with people in your life? <laughs> huh? Any of you? I mean, you lose your joy in having the people in your life. Yeah, okay, well, there you go. We're going to see how to how to work with that today. Philippians talks to us, says, hey, this is how you enjoy the people. Not just endure the people in your life, but how do you enjoy the people in your life? And I, 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 don't look at them. I mean, I know, you know, it's, I know it's tempting. I know it's tempting to like, you know, <laughs> it's kind of tacky though. Don't look. All right. Uh, second, how to be joyful no matter what. Okay, great. How to reduce conflict with others. Ever have any conflict? No, of course not. Uh, what's so special about Jesus? This is the book that has that great passage that says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought himself not robbery would be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And, oh, it's just a wonderful word. Uh, for me to live is Christ. For me to die is gain. Great stuff like that. God's part and my part in changing me. What am I supposed to do and what is God supposed to do? Conquering complaining. Oh, my. We do have any complainers in the house? Uh -huh. Yeah, make sure your children are here that day, all right? Uh, God's model for manhood, which is a wonderful little concept for us guys. How to maintain your joy. Great. Succeeding in life. Wouldn't that be a good word for somebody you know, huh? <laughs> how do I succeed in life? Uh, how to have less stress. Good night, man. We're living so such a stressful time, don't we? You guys don't have any trouble with stress or anything like that, I'm sure. But bring somebody with you that day. The secret of a satisfying life. The secret of a satisfying life. What is the secret of a satisfying life? How to be content. No matter how much you have, you can be dissatisfied. No matter how much money you make, you can be dissatisfied. No matter how nice your family is, you can be dissatisfied. Because you don't know how to be content with what you have. Well, the book of Philippians tells you how to be content with all those and God's promise to meet your needs. I know we all have needs and we all wonder, man, does God, does God care? Does God, does, does anything that I need, does God pay attention to what I need? Is there anything that I can depend on God for? Well, Philippians tell you all about that. See what I mean? This is a great book. This is a book about real stuff. 
It's a very personal book, just a, just a tiny little word. Let me read the first two verses because this is the start of a letter, actually. And here are the first two verses. Paul and Timothy. You've heard of Timothy before, right? How many of you have ever heard of the Apostle Paul? Let me just see you, okay? You've heard of the Apostle Paul. All right, good. Most everybody in here. All right, now, have, how many of you have heard of Timothy? All right, Timothy's his young son in the ministry. He's not like a physical son, but he's, a, he's like Wesley is to me, you know, just like a son in the ministry, somebody that I'm concerned and want to want to help and bless and, and lead them and, 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 and promote them to, to become a leader in, in, with the Lord. That's a Timothy. And Timothy's his young son in the ministry. All right, Paul and Timothy are writing this letter to the church at Philippi, a little city called Philippi. Philippi is in a place that's called, in Bible days, Macedonia. How many of you have ever heard of the Macedonian call? You've heard that phrase, the Macedonian call? The apostle Paul was on a missionary journey, and he heard the voice of God saying, go to Macedonia, and he saw an image and a vision of the people of Macedonia beckoning him to come to Macedonia because the gospel was not everywhere in the world. The apostle was carrying the gospel. This was in Europe. None of Europe had received the gospel yet. And so here was Paul carrying as the first Christian, carrying the Christian message of Jesus Christ for the first time into all of these places. And everywhere they went and people were won to the Lord. People believed in Christ. People let Jesus come into their life and their heart and they received him. And they started churches in these places. And these were little tiny places, little tiny churches. Didn't know anything about God didn't have pastors. I mean, they were in bad shape, but, but God cared about them. And so the Apostle Paul writes him a letter and says, hey, guys, let me just write you some stuff to help you and tell you what God might want to be saying to you today. And so here's this letter from Paul and Timothy, uh, servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the elders and deacons. Now, you see the elders and deacons, what does that tell you? It tells you there's a church there, right? It tells you there's an organized church there, right? Because they've got positions in the church. They've got bishops and deacons and overseers and elders and whatever else you want to call them. They're, they're an organized bunch. They're a bunch of people that have taken the Word of God and they've gotten other people and they've been one and now they're all together like a church. Look at your neighbor and say, just like us. Yeah, and just like us, right. I mean, like 10 years ago when we stepped out, I stepped out of another ministry uh, full of the Lord, full of Christ, had a call, had a mission, um, could have gone anywhere in the world, uh, lots of opportunities, lots of everything, but I felt like the Lord called me to stay right here in Gulfport, and uh, just like God called Paul to Macedonia and said, hey, stay, go right there and minister the gospel, and just stay, that's going to be your people, and so this is what happened to this little church at Philippi, and now they're a full-blown church, and he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's just a little opening introduction, and Paul opens most of his letters like this. Now, give you one, one little tiny maybe point of interest before we get into how to, how, how to deal with people in our life, all right? Because um, it starts right off the bat, guys, really. It starts with the next verse. The next verse starts telling us, this is how you deal with crazy people. All right. So, so but I want to tell you this one little thing. Uh, this letter was written while Paul was in prison. Now, just so you, you know, in being a Christian, that it doesn't guarantee you that you're never going to have any trouble or any problems in life. I know you really know this, right? If you've been with Christ very long, and if you haven't been with Jesus, I don't want to burst your bubble. But, I, you know, you're going to have some troubles. Mm -hmm. I mean, get ready. It, just because you've got Jesus in your heart, it doesn't guarantee that you're not going to have any issues going on in life. As a matter of fact, I tend to believe you have more issues when you have Christ because the devil is always attacking, you know. It's like, it's like all of a sudden you woke up a, a, a sleeping giant and now he's trying to hurt you all the time. So anyway, the apostle Paul gets thrown into prison for preaching the gospel. And I'll mention why in just a minute. It's in Acts 16. If you want to read Acts 16, you'll find out uh, what Paul's experiences were in Philippi. It's just a great quick thing, you know. I mean, he, he, he didn't stay there very long, but boy, he had some amazing experiences in Philippi where this little church started. I'm going to tell you, it's a really an amazing thing. But 
But he got thrown into prison because of preaching the gospel, and he was in Rome in the prison and chained to prison guards, one guard on each side, and he was chained to them. Or, or shall I say, they were chained to him. <laughs> I mean, you know, it was like, it was like how, how would you like to be chained to the Apostle Paul? I mean, every day when you showed up for work for the next 12 hours, you were going to be chained to the Apostle Paul. Imagine that. Imagine how much preaching you were going to get in that next 12 hours that you were chained. And I mean, you couldn't run away because you were locked to his arm, one on each side. And so Paul, you know, had a, had a captive crowd, so to speak. You know, it wasn't, wasn't like preaching at a coliseum somewhere, but it was effective. And, and anyway, while he was in prison, he wrote four letters. Um, and, and it's not important that you exactly know, but I will tell you, Colossians is one of them, Philippians is one of them, and uh, Ephesians is one of them, and a letter to Philemon, which if you've seen it in your Bible, you said, how do you even pronounce that name? Philemon was a slave owner, and Onesimus was his slave, and Onesimus ran away and came to Christ, and the apostle Paul was telling Philemon how to treat Onesimus, who had been his slave, how to treat him now that he's a Christian. That's what the book's about. But anyway, point being that, that he, he wrote four letters. They're called the prison epistles, and while he was in prison, he wrote these to these different places, and Philippi was one of them. So this is one of those letters while Paul is in prison, and I'm only telling you this because I want you to know when you start hearing what he says that he's in prison while he's writing this. Because, see, you think everybody that loves the Lord uh, sleeps in an ivory tower every night or has everything going their way, certainly has a blessed life that doesn't have any issues in it. And I'm just telling you, here's an example of the fact that that's not true, that he's in prison and he's writing a book about joy. Come on, Paul. I mean, what, you know, what would you be writing about if you were in prison? Oh, God has forsaken me, and God doesn't love me anymore. And if he loved me, he'd get me out of this terrible place Please send a cake with a file baked in it, would you? you know, that's what we'd be writing if we were in there. But man, Paul's writing about joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And, and good night in prison. Come on, Paul. You know, hey. I mean, that's why he said, you know, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Hey, you know, I'm a Jesus man. Wherever he has me, that's fine with me. Whether it's in a prison or outside at a coliseum, I don't care. I'm just, all I care about is if, I, am I doing what God wants me to do? That's what I really care about. And so he writes this, and, he, and, he, and, and of all things, of all things, he starts talking about, the first thing he starts talking about is people. Imagine that. Out of all the things you could just kind of start out talking about, the first thing that you would choose to talk about if you need real joy in your life would be people. I, I, well, I guess it's just because uh, if you have people problems, man, you got real problems. If you have people problems, you, your life can come to a grinding halt, right? You have people problems in your life, you got some real trouble, some real issues going on in your life because usually when you have problems with people, it doesn't just go away, right? Usually if it's people in your life that you're having trouble with, it can make life miserable for you. I can just testify as a parent, now this is just as a parent, if things are good with my children, things are good for me. If it's not good for my children, it's not good for me. Now, I may, you may say, oh, you're crazy, but oh, I'm, te- I'm trying to testify to the truth here that when, life, when my children are happy, I'm happy. When they're not happy, I'm not happy. I mean, it's just kind of like one of those little underlying things. And now we have eight grandchildren, so I can't imagine how life is going to be from now on. Surely we won't have to rise and fall with them, you know. But anyway... The only way you can really be happy and have children, you know, happy all the time is for them to live way, way away and you not know anything that's going on in their life. You just pick up the phone and you say, hello, baby, how are you? Oh, good, 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 good to hear from you. All right, kiss the grandchildren. We love you. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Yeah. Then you can be happy all the time and not be affected by them. If you know anything going on with them, hey, mom, I want to tell you about that. I don't, you know. But, uh, but the Apostle Paul starts with people, and so he says, okay, let me, let me tell you what you're going to have to have in your life, how life is going to have to be in order for you to enjoy 
people in your life. How many of you would like to enjoy the people in your life? Would you? Really? I mean, come on. How many people do you have in your life? Very many. Yeah. Well, you want to enjoy them, right? You don't want to just endure the people in your life. Like every time you see them, it's like, oh, God, please go home quick. You know, get out of it. Yeah. Yeah, work a lot. <laughs> work a lot. We want to enjoy. Yeah, I mean, some of you have bosses. Some of you have employees. Some of you have teachers. Some of you have uh, cousins and aunts and relatives and mates, you know, husbands and wives, children. You got a lot of people in your life. You want to enjoy those people rather than just endure them? Well, Paul says, all right, here's how you do it. And Philippians tells us how we do it. All right, let me just show you the first way. Number one, if you are going to enjoy the people in your life, here you are going to need to focus on the good in people. All right, now that probably is not surprising to you because you've heard maybe something like that before. Like, uh, everybody has some good in them, baby. If you can just look for it, you'll find the good. Now, I'm going to tell you, sometimes you're going to have to look real deep. Sometimes it's just going to take a heart. You need a magnifying glass to find some of it. But everybody has some good in them. And I'm just saying to you, if you're going to enjoy the people in your life, you're going to have to start looking for the good in those people. Let me just show you what Paul does here with this third verse. Look at this third verse. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. So he first thing he says, he says, look, guys, I have some memories of when I was at Philippi. I sure do. And you know what I remember? I remember the good stuff we did. I remember the good people of Philippi. I remember how well you treated me and how good it was to be with you. And I remember how faithful you were, and you showed up, and you supported, and you did. And, 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 and you know what I remember? I remember good. I think Paul was writing this letter with a smile on his face, actually. I really do. He's writing the letter going, these Philippians, oh, that's good. You know, because he enjoys them. Now, just so you'll know that he's choosing to do this, let me tell you what happened to him in Philippi. Just, just a little thumbnail. Now, remember, I told you, go to Acts 16. You can read every bit of this because that's where it is. When he was at Philippi, a little bitty short period of time, first thing happened to him, he, it's, it, it, it's, Pete, it's Paul and it's Silas. You've heard of Silas. His missionary buddy is Paul and it's Silas. And it's Dr. Luke. How many of you ever heard of Dr. Luke? Wrote one of the epistles. I mean, wrote one of the gospels, excuse me, Dr. Luke. All right, he was there and Timothy was with him. And they were walking down the road in, in Philippi, and they came across a woman who had purple material for sale right there on the side of the road. And her name was Lydia. And Lydia, the Bible says that Lydia was a worshiper of God. So Lydia was a worshiper of God, but she didn't know anything about Jesus Christ, never heard of Jesus or anything. So the Apostle Paul Right there on, on the first little stroll down the street, he runs into a woman who is selling purple, which is a very majestic, expensive cloth and material. You know, she was, you know, a wealthier type of a person, and she was a seller of purple and all that. And he starts talking to her about Christ, and she comes to faith in Christ right there. And then her whole household believes, and the Apostle Paul baptizes her and all of her household. And she becomes the first Christian on the continent of Europe. Isn't, isn't that amazing? Right there off the street of Philippi, Lydia, a woman. All right, he goes down the street just a little bit more, and there's this, there's this young slave girl that, is, that has a couple of masters, and she's telling fortunes on the street, telling people's fortunes. And, and, and as Paul and, and the group approach, and Timothy and Silas and, you know, uh, and, and, and Dr. Luke, as they approach, she starts... Uh, 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 yelling out at them, and, 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 and she starts uh, accosting them about, these are men of the Most High God. These are men of the I mean, she's just like, like blasting at them and just causing a ruckus. And so the apostle Paul walks over there to her, and he looks in her, and he sees a demon. And he casts the demon out of that young girl. And when he casts the demon out of her, she can't tell fortunes anymore. 
And so the people that were owned her now were broke because they didn't have any other job to do, and she had just lost her ability to tell fortunes. And so they got all hot about that, went down and told the magistrates of the city and went to the police department and said this, they had accosted this little young girl. And they came down there, and they, and they, beat, Paul, <laughs> they beat Paul and Silas. They beat them with rods and tore the clothes off of them and took them and threw them in the jail, right in the jail. Now, they were Roman citizens, and these, and these guys didn't know that, and, it, and that'll matter in just a second, but you can't do that to, just, to Roman citizens. You can't treat them like that. You know, you got to have a trial. You got to prove them guilty. You got to do all that kind of stuff, but they, they just treated them horribly. They just beat the clothes off of them, threw them in the jail, and, uh, and then guess what happened in the jail? At midnight, at midnight, yeah, the jail started, the jail started rumbling. God sent an earthquake angel down to the Philippi. And said, "Go down there and get them out." And he just and he grabs the prison and he just starts, and the, and the, and and the prison starts breaking up and the doors swing open, allowing all the prisoners to escape. And then the jailer comes up there and the jailer sees what's happened. And the jailer, supposing all the prisoners to have escaped and run away, was about to commit suicide. And the apostle Paul said, "Hey, wait, man. Hey, we're we're all here. None of us ran away." We're all here. Don't do yourself any harm. And the Philippian jailer was so shocked and stunned by this and so amazed at somebody who would be like this, ran over to the apostle Paul and, 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 and Timothy and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And the apostle Paul said, Here's what you do. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. And he did, and his whole family did, and they baptized him and his whole family right there in the city of Philippi. That's Paul's experience in Philippi. And see, all that trouble, I mean, what would you, if you wrote back to him, you said, hey, you remember that time y'all beat the clothes off of him and threw him in the jail? <laughs> what is it you choose to focus on? When you think about people in your life, what is it, do you choose to focus on the positive things about those people? Or do you choose to focus on the negative things about those people? That, that, that's really all I'm saying in here is that you make a choice about what you remember about people. And if you are going to enjoy people rather than just endure them, you are going to have to remember the good in people. And the great thing, I mean, you talk to somebody, you say, man, I tell you, Uncle Louie, I just love you. You're just so awesome. But... Well, ain't, ain't Susie, she's so kind. She's such a wonderful lady, and she, she just does such funny things. But when you say but, what does that do? It just cancels everything, right? Everything you just said is canceled, and now you're going to say something negative about something. That's what but means. Anytime you hear but, that's what's about to come. And the Apostle Paul says, look, we got to live life without, <laughs> I'm going to say without a but, 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 without, <laughs> but you know what I mean, all right? Without, mm, got to live life looking for the good in people. And Paul said, <clears throat> I thank God on, um, uh, in all of my remembrance of you. And then always in every prayer of mine for, for, for you all making my prayer with joy. But let's skip that verse for a second. Look at verse 5. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Whew, he said, you know what I remember good about you? You guys were so loyal. You were with me from the first day and you are still with me. And I've just got to commend the fact that you are loyal. Let me just ask you something. The people that are loyal to you in your life, do you ever thank them for being loyal to you in your life? I mean, look at yourself. Huh? I mean, do, do you deserve that kind of loyalty? But they're still there, right? They hung in there with you. Now, you, they may do some stuff you don't like, and they may do some things that embarrass you, or they may do some things that seem to be awkward and messed up and all that, but at least they are loyal, and they hung in there with you, and they're still with you, and that's worthy of some respect. So the Apostle Paul says, man, I remember the good stuff, and if you're going to get along and have a good life with people, you're going to have to remember the good stuff. Thank God for the loyalty you were with me. I mean, he just points out things that are, that are just wonderfully good things. That, that, you, that you see in people, and that's what has to happen if you're going to get along and enjoy people in life. All right, second thing. 
pray, practice positive praying. All right? Practice positive praying. Oh, Lord. Give him a stroke, God. Give him a stroke. <laughs> Cancer would be really good. Yeah, I mean, pour some hot grease on him, God. Go ahead. Yeah. Now, now, that's not positive praying. Now, that's the kind of praying that we do a lot of times. Now, I mean, I'm not saying you probably never said, God, give a stroke. But, but you've, you haven't been positive in your, in your prayer, right? I mean, it's kind of like, oh, Lord, get them out of my life. Or, Lord, you know, uh, put them somewhere else, God. Take them away from here. You know? I mean, you know, you use all kinds of phrases and terms. But remember, God knows your heart. So just, just remember what you're saying. But, but here it is in, in the verse. It's the verse 4 that I kind of skipped over. Uh, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Now, look, look. Verse 4, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer, what's the next two words, with joy. All right, Apostle Paul says, you know what? When I pray for you, I'm smiling. When I pray for you, I'm enjoying praying for you. Because I'm praying for you that God would do some wonderful things in your life. Let me, let me just say this to you. You know how to straighten out or how to put things on a straight track in, in your life with, in relationship to others? I mean, really, start praying for them. I'm not, no, not God give them a stroke and kill them again. No, I mean, start praying positively for them. Start saying, God, I, well, as a matter of fact, let me show you what he prayed for. For these people. Look, this is verse 9, 10, 11, chapter 1. Look at what he prayed for them. Let's see if you could pray this for any of your people in your life. And if you did, would it make any difference? All right, let me show. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. All right, what's that about? The first thing Paul says is look, what you can pray for somebody, the very first thing you can pray for them is you can pray that their love for Christ will grow more and more in their life. You say, would, 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 that, would that really change them? Well, maybe, but i tell you what it would do. It, it would change you, <laughs> Right? You start praying. Now, think about this. Think about that person in your life that you have the most difficulty with. And don't point at them. Just think. All right. Think about the person you have the most difficulty and say to yourself, all right, I'm going to have to have this person in my life for the rest of my life. I'm kin to them, man. You know, they're going to be at every family reunion, every wedding, uh, every graduation. They're going to be, I'm going to be somebody I have to deal with in my life. All right. I don't want to live the rest of my life just having to endure this person. I want to be able to enjoy this person in my life. God, help me to enjoy. All right, so whenever I start praying, I start praying. And Lord, for my person, I, I'm, Lord, I pray, you know what? I pray that they will grow more and more in love with you, and that love for you would shine more and more and get broader and broader in their life, Lord. All right, okay. Now I'm praying for them. I'm not criticizing. I'm not looking for the bad. I'm praying that the Lord would be blessed in their life. And let me ask you this. Do you think God would answer a prayer like that? Uh, well, let me just put it another way. I know most of us are always looking for God's will, right? You're saying, I will pray according to God's will. Because we've, we, we've been assured that if we pray according to God's will, that he'll answer that prayer, right? So we're always looking for, I want to pray according to God's will. Well, if you want to pray according to God's will and something in the Word of God already tells you that that's His will, when you pray it, you can be assured that you are praying in God's will, right? All right, that's not complicated, right? Just go kind of, hello, all right, that's not real complicated. So whenever the Bible gives me instructions on what I can pray that's God's will, if I will pray it, I will be praying in God's will, knowing that God is going to answer that prayer and help that that be accomplished in life. Right, all right. Look at what else I pray. I pray also so that you may approve what is excellent. In other words, uh, God, help them to be wise. Give them wisdom. That stuff that's excellent, help them see that it's excellent and help them say yes to it in their life. Man, wouldn't that be a good thing? God, I pray for this 
thorn in my flesh, and I pray, God, that you would help them to, to grow more and more in love with you every day, then that people would be able to see them in love with you. And God, I pray that the good things that happen in life, that they would recognize that they're good and attach on to them, God, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Lord, one of these days when they stand before you, that they might be true and they might be blameless and they might be righteous and they might be holy in their life. Lord, could you do that in their life? In verse 11, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And God, I pray lastly that they would bring glory to you in their life that their life would reflect glory that you put in them, God. See what I'm saying? I'm just saying most of us say things like, man, I need, I need, I want to enjoy people. I'm so tired of being around people that are such problems. I'm sick and tired of that. And I'm just saying if you are, here's how you get away from that. First thing is you, you start amplifying the good. You, you recognize that people have good in them and focus on that instead of the bad. You can. And then you start praying positive things for them because they need the prayers and <laughs> you need the practice, all right? So pray for them. All right, here's the third thing. The third thing is recognize that God is not finished with people yet. Mm hmm you might also write under that, be patient with their progress. That, that might be a little easier. Mm. Be patient with their progress because things don't happen overnight. Boom, boom, boom. I know they're still a mess. I know they're still bothering you. I know that it's aggravating. They're not perfect, right? Neither are you, right? <laughs> so... What is this all about? This is about the way we have of judging people. We all make judgments about people from our own perspectives. And by that, I simply mean most of the time we look at people from not how far they have come, but how far they still have to go. And based on, on a scale of how far they still have to go, they may be a long way from where they need to go in life. And if you're waiting for them to get to that before you can have any dealings with them or have any kindness about them or any good word or good image or positive thing to say about them, if you're waiting till they get to where they have to go, you may never see that on this side of eternity. Because they have a long way to go, and guess what? So do you. We all do. Have you ever, have you ever surprised yourself at, far, at how much further you have to go? In other words, you thought you were further along than you really are, right? Huh? You, you've, had, you, you've had things happen, and then you've surprised yourself at how you responded, right? Because you said to yourself, I'm never going to talk like that anymore. And then all of a sudden something happened, and here comes, bloop, 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 blue streak coming out. And then you, and when, and when it's over and your anger subsides, you say, you're embarrassed. You're, you're ashamed of yourself. You said, God, I thought I was farther along than that. What in the world? But God just gives them a circumstance where you get to see that you're not quite as far along as you thought you were. Well, welcome to the club. We all have a long way to go. This just means we recognize this not only for ourselves, but for other people in our life. And we give them a break. I mean, they're, they're human just like you. Now, it doesn't mean that we become enablers and, and codependent and all of those other dysfunctional, crazy things. It doesn't mean that we let them take advantage of us and that we, you know, we make the same foolish mistakes and, 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 and we don't pay attention and we allow them to do anything and we just say we're going to forget it. No, 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 no. No, you, you, you know, you know how to watch people in your life. You know, look, I'm going to tell you something. If you treat me wrong once, well, you might slip up on me. But the second time, I'm going, it, it would only be because I let you the second time because our eyes are all over you. I'm going to tell you that. My beady little eyes will be right up on you. 
because I'm not going to I'm not going to let you hurt me again. I mean, how dumb would that be? Ridiculous. But I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to pray great things for you, and I'm going, to, I'm going to ask God to do great things in your life, and I'm going to be looking for something that is good that I can try to help draw out of your life and be a positive part of your life. If you're going to have people in your life, people are going to mess up. People are not going to always do the right things. And so you have to practice certain things in order for that to be enjoyable in your life. A mate, a boss, an employee, a schoolmate, a friend, a family member. I mean, come on. You know, these are the people we're talking about. So the Apostle Paul says, if you want to enjoy the people, all right, here's what you do. You, 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 you recognize that, that people have issues, but they all have some good in it, and you look for it no matter how long it takes. <laughs> Number two, you pray positive stuff for them. Number three, you, you're patient with their progress, how far they yet have to go. This is what the Apostle Paul says, verse 6, And I am sure of this, that he who begun a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. That's that verse that says, God who begun a good work in you will keep on performing it until Jesus comes. The day of Jesus Christ, by the way, just a little offshoot here. In the book of Philippians, when you see the day, the day of judgment, it's talking about the great white throne judgment at the end of time. When it talks about the day of Jesus Christ, it's talking about the judgment seat of Christ where Christians sit and are judged according to, their, according to what they've done, their names are in the book of life. I don't have time to go into all that, but you'll hear a lot about that in Revelation. But that's what that means. So Paul is saying, look, we as Christians, we're going to stand before Jesus one day, and we're going to be evaluated as to how we lived our life. And Jesus is going to keep on performing that good stuff that he starts in you. Look, when I got saved, listen, I, I know that most of you are not aware of this because I'm such a wonderful person now. <laughs> I'm so awesome. Um, you know, I mean, I'm Dr. Keith Thrash now. I mean, you know, I'm, I mean, I, I used to not be that. But, uh, but, man, if you could just see where God brought me from and what kind of person I was, it was it's unbelievable, guys. But when I came to Christ, when I said, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin, wash me, come into my life. Be my Lord. Change me, Jesus. I give myself to you. I wave the white flag. I've messed up my life. Jesus, do something with this mess, would you? When I did that, Jesus started working in me. And when you did that, if you've done that, he started working in you. And he's still working in you. Because what God starts, God finishes. Thank you, Jesus. That he does. Hey, you've never seen like a one-winged bird, right? Uh, you know, you've never seen like half of a, of a caterpillar or something. I mean, that's supposed to be the finished product. No, God finishes what he starts, right? Well, this verse just says, look, Jesus began working in you the day you got saved, the day you came to him, and he's not going to quit working in you until you stand before his throne one day, being evaluated like an Olympic judge, 9.9, 8.2, 3.1, uh, you know, whatever you receive for the life that you have lived. You won't be standing there if you don't know Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, you're going to be at another throne. Ain't going to be half as, ain't going to be near about as happy as that. And then you're not going to be receiving the crown of life. It's going to be the other way with you. But at this throne, you won't be there if you're not saved. But if you are saved, you are going to be there. And Jesus is working in you right now. Are you any more joyful than you were when you, got, when you first came to Christ? Are you any more loving? Do you have more peace in your life? Are you more long-suffering? Are you gentler than you used to be? I mean, are, is there anything about your life that's moving forward with Christ? That's just what that's about. And he says, look, we got, this is what, when, when people are in our life and we want to enjoy them, we have got to recognize that God's working on them and he's not finished with them yet and he's going to keep on working until they go home one day, all right? You know where we're going to be perfect? When we stand right there with Jesus. <laughs> and until then, we're works in progress. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm a work in progress. All right, I am too, and you are too. Welcome to the club. All right, number four. Number four. Remember, we're talking about enjoying the people in your life. He says, all right, here's what you got to do. You know, pray positive things for them. Recognize they got some ways to go. Look for the good in it and talk, focus on the good. Here's number four. Love people from your heart. 
Love people from your heart. Let me show you the verse. It's verse 7 and verse 8 in chapter 1. Just following right down the line. It is right for me to feel this way. You know, he said, I, I, I thank God in every remembrance of you. I pray for you with joy and so forth. And then he says, it's right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. You know, one of our problems with people is we don't love people from our heart. We love them from our head. That's one of our problems. We, 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 we try to evaluate everything. We try to logically reason everything. Has anybody ever said, to, had poured out themselves to you? I mean, just like a mate. Let's just say, guys, you go home and your wife is crying about something. And you say, what's wrong, babe? And, you, and she starts telling you how she feels, right? I feel this and I'm feeling I just don't feel it. And then what do you do? You, 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 if you haven't been well trained, you, let me tell you what you're going to do. If you haven't been well trained, you are going to start telling her and giving her a list of four or five reasons why she shouldn't feel that way. And all I'm saying to you is that she feels what she feels. What she feels is what she feels. And no amount of logic and no amount of reasoning is going to change the way she feels. So what happens with us with people in our life is rather than loving people from our heart, we want to love people from our head, and we want to make everything about their life be rational and reasonable and logical in life, or else we're not going with them. And the Apostle Paul says, Look, the way, reason I feel the way I feel, I love you. I'm writing a letter smiling. Uh, I remember every good thing. God's doing a great work in you. I'm praying that he'll do more and more and more. And the reason I can do this, it's right for me to do this because I hold you in my heart, not in my head. For you are all partakers with me of grace both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Paul says, look, I love you from my heart with the affection of Christ Jesus. How do you get the affection of Christ Jesus? It gets put in you. You know how it gets put in you? The Holy Spirit brings it with him. When the Holy Spirit invades your life, which is what the Bible teaches happens when we receive Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us. He brings the love, the affection of Jesus Christ with him and pours it into our heart so that now we have the opportunity to love people deeper than ever, with more abundance than ever with more grace than ever, with more mercy than ever. We can love them with the affections of Jesus Christ because the affections have been delivered into our heart by a Holy Spirit. You say, man, you're such a loving person. How do you do that? It's the Holy Spirit in my life. It's the affections of Jesus Christ put in this crusty old stuffy, stiff heart of stone turns it into a heart of flesh, opens it up so that Jesus can love other people through me. That's what the affections of Jesus Christ are. Let me carry you, and I'm finished, with one, one more little place here, into the book of Romans. Romans, Paul wrote Romans. It's the greatest theological book in existence of mankind. It is unbelievable. 16 chapters of the deepest, richest, greatest stuff you've ever seen. But look at what it says. This is just a little explanation. This is in chapter 5, starting in, in, in verse 1. Here's what Paul says. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we've made just as if we had never sinned by faith in Christ. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How are we at peace with God? Through our good works? No. Through our smart mind? No. Through going to church? No. Through giving tithes? No. No. We are made at peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord, period. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings 
knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. There you go. So you thought I was making that up. <laughs> she thought, oh, that sounds good, Pastor, but that's not really what happened. Well, somebody needs to tell Paul and the Holy Spirit and Jesus because that's exactly because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. All right, so want to enjoy the people in your life? First thing, do I know Christ? Is Jesus, is Christ my Savior? Is Jesus living on the inside of me? Has God's love been poured into my heart through the Holy Spirit, which now lives on the inside of me? Is my life a testimony that I've given myself to Christ truly? Not just some plastic Jesus game, you know, not just coming and doing, saying some words, but have I really given myself to Jesus Christ? And then secondly, how do I, how do I deal with the people around me? Do I look for the good in people? Do I, do, I, do, I, well, I, do I pray for them uh, that God would do positive things in their life and that he would bring his glory through them? And, and am I patient with, with the fact that they still have a, some ways to go? And how about my heart? Is my heart loving or is my heart just looking for a reason to condemn them and criticize them and belittle them and, and, and lamb blast them? Is there any love in my heart that is unexplainable that God would put in my heart? Might be an evidence that Christ isn't there, you know? You need to get right with that. That's what God says. All right, so there we are. First message, book of Philippians, 14 more. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Just kidding. All right, stand to your feet.